We've had some uh, wonderful science this morning. Uh, we're now down to the clinical end of things, and I hope I've interpreted the science okay in this, so uh, please bear with me. Uh, the chat that I'm going to talk about is polycystic ovarian syndrome and insulin resistance and a lifetime of opportunities. 1977 was an extraordinary year. There's a prize for anybody who can tell me who was the most famous person who died that year. Elvis! Yes. <laughs> but the more significant thing that I think that happened that year was that the American government decided that it was time to tell the American people what they should eat, what they shouldn't eat. And this was with the understanding they believed at the time that fat was the cause of heart disease. So they instituted the idea of low fat and high carbohydrate. That is a paradigm that, of course, is so superbly entrenched, it's still here today. And we're going to have to have a battle fighting against that. The ideas were so strong at the time, or the force of the American government was so strong, that nearly every country in the world adopted the guidelines and that paradigm. What we think has happened is this association, however. It's been a profound association between that paradigm and the commencement of the big increases in obesity, 64% of the Australian population, type 2 diabetes, escalating around the world at an incident greater than we've ever imagined, but all of the other chronic diseases as well, they all seem to flow together somewhat. So my belief is that we need to change this paradigm. But we cannot, taking the words of Albert, solve our problems with the same thinking we used when we created them. We may have some opening here so that we can create a dream where maybe we can reduce these chronic diseases because Gerald Raven, in the 1980s, showed us that there is a common thread, a common pathology that exists in a lot of the chronic diseases. And I want to introduce you to the idea that polycystic ovarian syndrome is, in fact, one of the insulin resistance related diseases. Only last week or the week before, our very eminent professor Norman from Adelaide, who's have been a leader in polycystic ovary disease in the world for many, many years, made the statement that 95% of the heavier obese women who have got polycystic ovary syndrome are insulin resistant. And yes, there are some thin people with uh, polycystic ovary syndrome, and 75% of those are thought to have insulin resistance. And I'd like to use polycystic ovarian syndrome as a surrogate marker of all of the insulin resistance related diseases. It may be a little step too far, but that's what I wish to do today. It's a syndrome, polycystic ovary syndrome. A syndrome is a cluster of features that when combined together may be capable of causing some other issues for the person who's got it. So for example, with polycystic ovarian syndrome, Infertility and type 2 diabetes are definite potentials. Now, in case any of the men in the audience, uh, Professor Schofield was a bit worried about talking about female things, I've got no trouble with it at all. <laughs> uh, polycystic ovarian syndrome is present in 10 to 20 percent, and if any of the men are thinking they should leave, don't, because it could be your wife, it could be your partner, it could be your daughter. It is an enigma because we don't really know, is it acquired or is it inherited? There are a hundred candidate genes for this disorder, but none of them are truly predictive. And several of those candidate genes are the same as for type 2 diabetes and for obesity. So it presents with a, we, we, we've got no easy diagnosis and we've got no one treatment for it. We've got no one blood test for polycystic ovarian syndrome. Uh, we've got some that help, but no one. It presents with a, a spectrum of symptoms, any of which may be present or absent, like acne, unwanted hair in unwanted places, that's what hirsutism is, 
delayed fertility, which will usually be due to lack of ovulation, ovarian cysts, little follicles that are recognizable on ultrasound scan, and sometimes the blood male hormone higher than expected in the female, but never as high as what's present in the male. And the syndrome results in reproductive metabolic and psychological problems, and there's no doubt about that. And the extent to the symptoms uh, being portrayed will be due to the background pathologies, which are interrelationships between excessive androgen, insulin resistance, and obesity. The obesity in these people happens earlier and happens at a greater rate than it does in those who do not have polycystic ovary syndrome. As the obesity worsens, all of the other parameters worsen. Now, I want to look at the lifetime opportunities that we may have for correcting this disorder. Again, because it's insulin resistance, I think we may have an answer because I think we now feel we are able to manage insulin resistance with proper nutrition, not the nutrition from that paradigm that we've had since 1977. And we use our good friend uh, and mentor for us all, uh, Hippocrates, healing is a matter of time, but it is sometimes a matter of opportunities. And I'd like to look at the life course of a person with polycystic ovarian syndrome. When I see them as an infertility doctor, these uh, people, uh, quite often it's towards the end of their reproductive career, and it's an ear guarantee that they will already be quite overweight or obese. And that combination is a difficult one for the fertility people. But if you look back on the history, they will have had multiple episodes when they've presented, like all of these. And we know that they'll have been told, go and lose weight, but it was by the old paradigm. We know that we'll give them the pill to try and control some of these effects, and we know we've got some medications to create ovulation induction. But it can require IVF. And when they do become pregnant, they have got a greater incidence of miscarriage, of gestational diabetes, of uh, hypertension, of stillbirth, and we can predict their future as well. They're going to have more type 2 diabetes, more coronary artery disease, more cancers, and more Alzheimer's, I believe. I did say that we were uncertain, but there is some backing that this is an inherited disorder, uh, maybe amplified by things that happen through our life course, uh, so acquired. And we look at the inherited side here for a moment. There was great work done in England by Professor David Barker, which drew an association between birth weight and subsequent early death from heart attack. That hypothesis of his from the 1980s has grown now into the developmental origins of health and disease, which suggests that the preconception time and the pregnancy time actually create environment for the rest of a person's life as to whether they're going to have long-term good health or a propensity to develop some of our chronic diseases, possibly that's through insulin resistance. And if we look at the mother and the father, we should be aiming as much as we possibly can to get them metabolically as healthy as possible and help them with other lifestyle possibilities. You see the sperm and the egg, there's a lot of nuclear material in there that's going to be passed on and create the new baby. And that nuclear material, our, our uh, forerunner to us as humans, that nuclear material has on its outside a thing called the epigenome, which is a collection of um, chemicals which actually determine how that genetic material is going to be expressed. And it behoves us to think about that epigenome for a moment because it's heavily influenceable by our environment and our lifestyle. So, for example, smoking, alcohol, uh, nutrition, 
uh, physical activity, sleep patterns, um, stress, uh, infections, drugs, all of these things have an impact on our epigenome, which then has an impact on our genetic material going forward. So I think we've really got to concentrate on helping couples who are going to achieve pregnancy to be at their metabolic best health. Pregnancy, now I hope that I am not scraping too hard on the surface here for some people, but I contacted Professor Tim Noakes to help me on this, and he assured me uh, that what I was thinking may well be correct. Pregnancy is an insulin-resistant state. And throughout the pregnancy, that insulin resistance increases. The mother, at any, uh, well, may be ketotic in early pregnancy. And anything that increases her glyc glucose levels, so she develops hyperglycemia for some reason, that does go across to the baby. And her insulin does not go across the placenta. So the baby has to react to that hyperglucose st state that it now has. The baby's pancreas has to respond to that. And the insulin produced by the baby's pancreas, is, of course, is going to be elevated somewhat to get rid of that glucose as quickly as possible. And the usual happens. The deposition of fat is part and parcel of the distribution of hyperglycemia. So already inside in the pregnancy, we're creating a situation, if there's hyperglycemia throughout the pregnancy, where the baby is possibly already being predisposed to becoming insulin resistant. Obese as a younger ch person may be insulin resistance uh, predisposed already from inside in the uterus. So we look again at polycystic ovarian syndrome as that important uh, event which I'm using as a marker, a surrogate for the other diseases as well of insulin resistance. I'm actually drawing a conclusion here that I'm taking advantage of a statement by Annie Murphy Paul in her 2010 book called Origins, and I'm changing it a little bit to suit my purposes. But preconception and pregnancy may be the most influential and consequential period in a person's life. Interventions. A person becomes diabetic or PCOS at age 40. Why have we not been thinking all those other presentations beforehand? And why are we not thinking even before that? That we have got an ability now to reduce insulin resistance by the nutrition that we need to be telling people about, not the paradigm that needs to be changed. So low carbohydrate diet is the way. And the most effective time to get a, a person to respond to these things is preconception and during pregnancy. Sure enough, when a person has diabetes diagnosed or pre-diabetes uh, with the HbA1c elevated, we've got opportunities. And Verta Health and others are showing great results at being able to fix the problem to a degree. But if we get them before that happens in prediabetes, or we get them in infertility clinics and elsewhere, earlier and earlier, we should be thinking that maybe we can help them with proper nutritional advice that will influence their wellness or ill health for the rest of their lives. But what is the nature of that intervention? Now, I've put this slide up. It's my take on it. But I think a lot of people have no idea what a carbohydrate is. Carbohydrates are sugars at the end of the day. It's a vegetable sugar, or it's a fruit sugar, a refined or processed sugar, or it's sugar sugar in all its forms. And, for, uh, and we've got the great selection of carbohydrate restriction protocols that we'll surely find people can drift in and out of and, and, and uh, obtain benefit. But for, for the spectrum of people who are insulin resistant, so let's say somebody who's got polycystic ovary syndrome or somebody who's got diabetes or somebody who's heavily overweight and wants to lose weight, we've got to be 
more severe with the restriction on carbohydrate. And that's why I've got these in red here, because at the end of the day, anybody who really wants uh, possibly the better chance of not uh, pushing insulin resistance in their bodies and maybe getting a longer, healthier life and avoiding, getting to the dream of being able to avoid the chronic diseases in our lives, then we need to be very restrictive. And what's interesting here, for me, is who would you tell this to? Well, 64% of the Australian population are already overweight or obese. One in four Australians have got a chronic disease. One in eight have got two or more of those same chronic diseases that I showed earlier. 25% of children under the age of 18 are obese or overweight. There are more diabetics type 2 being diagnosed among children than ever. This is a new thing. So I think we should be thinking of everyone. Every opportunity that you've got at every single consultation for a doctor or a health professional of any other type, for a, f a, a family person who's got their own sphere of in influence, can make a difference. We've got, in summary, a fantastic marker of insulin resistance for all of the other chronic diseases. We should take advantage of every opportunity to correct that paradigm from the past and give them proper nutrition advice at all stages, which is, it would appear, low carbohydrate. We do this as individuals. We cannot wait. The American Diabetes Association has made a concession just last week with their European counterparts. The Australian Diabetes Association made a concession in August that low carbohydrate is a good way to manage diabetes and all the other insulin related diseases we, we can uh, assume as well. But the international guidelines for polycystic ovarian syndrome came out in the last month or two. And they have said there is no one diet better than another for managing the obesity and overweight. This is a scandal because that's going to be present, written black and white, to annoy us for the next five or ten years. <laughs> we are the ones who are going to make a difference here. We do it within our own circle of influence.